Hi everyone, welcome to our 21st, uh, 23rd session of the Main AI Group Exchange. So this week we have John Benoit from Stanford here with us to present his research on multimodal medical models encompassing language and vision. JB is currently a postdoc in the Department of Biomedical Data Science at Stanford, advised by Daniel Rubin. His research is on multimodal learning on natural images and texts, especially in the context of healthcare, where he focuses on applying new or proven methods on multimodal medical tasks at the intersection of vision and language. Thank you so much, John Manbao, for, for joining us today. So before we start, um, do you have any preference on how you would like to take in questions? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, anyone is free to ask question whenever he wants and interrupt me. Okay, great. All right, so let's try to make this session as interactive as possible. And yeah, and uh, if you have any, any questions, please feel free to ask. Without further ado, let me hand it over to JB. All right, thank you for the introduction and welcome everyone. So yeah, the presentation of today is uh, multimodal medical research at the intersection of vision and language. So vision, I'm talking mostly and, and exclusively about images. Uh, I'm not really working with videos right now, at least. So um, in this presentation, I will focus mostly on X-rays, um, especially because we have big X-ray data sets uh, with radiology reports, so text. And the text is in natural language. Um, it's not just, you know, keywords. Um, we have really, um, you know, uh, a good size, good amount of radiology reports in natural language um, written by radiologists. And the idea is to work with both modalities to improve the tasks we are working on. Um, sometimes as well, obviously we have a label. Um, for example, in this case, it would be <laughs> no findings. Um, so I will leave that a little bit aside, um, but obviously there is a lot of work, uh, you know, using both modalities to improve, for example, the accuracy of, of, of labels of diagnostics. All right, the outline of this of this presentation. So I will first start with um, you know supervised um, um, visual linguistic learning or you know, um, you know supervised multimodal learning, but I just want to emphasize that is vision and language. Um, I picked, I think, two tasks that are very different in nature, um, and you could, you know, have different conclusion on how good is the tasks. So I just would like to present the task to you, what we can do with it, what are the results we get. Um, I won't be talking, ex you know, really about the architecture um, of the solutions. I just want to focus on what the task itself uh, is and, and, and why we are trying to solve that. Then the second part is uh, unsupervised uh, multimodal learning or visual linguistic learning. Um, I will talk mostly about um, contrastive pre-training. Um, it's rather a self-supervised technique. Um, what I mean by unsupervised or self-supervised is that we, we don't work with the labels. We just have both modalities and we try to find interesting representation. That's the second part of my, of my presentation. And then, you know, a third part about the future tasks that could exist in the visual visual linguistic world i just you know let my my imagination wander and 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 i just try to think about tasks that don't exist right now uh, or you know application that don't exist but could be uh, could well be in a, in in a, in, a, in a near future okay so let's start with the first part supervised uh, visual linguistic learning so visual and question answering exists in the medical field. It's obviously related and inspired from uh, visual question answering for natural images. Um, so you have as input a, a, an image and a question, and then you try to compute characteristics for both modalities and, and, and output a label. Um, and we have, you know, why, why is visual question answering interesting? Um, and I think Wendy Len Lenner says that much better than I could do. Um, she is a, a famous American computer scientist. And she says, when a person understands the story, they can demonstrate their understanding by answering questions about the story. Since questions can be devised to query any aspect of text comprehension, the ability to answer question is the strongest possible demonstration of understanding. So indeed, visual question answering is a very difficult task. If we have robots that can answer question of images about images, whatever however the question is formed 
um, then probably there is some understanding you know, uh, in the machine. So let's do that for medical, you know, the medical field. We have the data set that is called VQA Med. Uh, it's published by the Image Cliff um, Initiative. Um, yeah, um, the Image Cliff Group, a bunch of universities just organize, organize, organizing challenges. Um, and so what happens is that as input, again, we have an image, we have a question, uh, we pre-process both modalities and we output an answer. It's a classification problem. Yes, no, um, and obviously more nuanced answers. Um, what are the motivation of, of this task? Well, obviously it's automate, the most obvious one is automated medical image interpretation. Uh, we have a robot that is able to process thousands of images very quickly if we have question about that. Um, I think it's very interesting also for the patients. We know that patients more and more have access to, the, to their own medical data and so they could, for example, query, you know, the machine about their own medical data if they have a question about their own X-ray, for example. Um, obviously, enhance the clinician confidence by providing a second opinion. Um, we have, um, you know, a, a machine that is available for the clinician in case they want a second opinion. And we would like, again, if we have really expert machine that can interact with a human, um, well, we would like to avoid people to just Google their problem and then find the worst possible outcome that could happen and, and, and just rather query a machine that is an expert in the imaging, you know, um, and, then, and then get answer from the machine uh, uh, compared to Google, yeah. So architecture wise, I won't go into details, but it's very related if, if you ever happen to read what's what's happening in v, VQA for natural images, you know, it's, you know, the state of the art architecture as always for the question, you can just use a transformer and uh, for the image you use a powerful ResNet or RCNN, you know, a region-based proposal network. You fuse modalities, you have a big classifier and this is usually how it works. And it gives, it gives you know, good performances also uh, for medical uh, imaging. So as I said, it's a image clay is somehow a challenge. Um, so we also, I think it was last year, oh no, it was this year, um, we submitted a, a solution and a paper. We finished uh, fourth or, or, or third, actually we have, we have the same results. In terms of accuracy, the accuracy is quite low. <laughs> so three times, you know, uh, one, one over three times, you, you know, we fail. We, uh, two over three times we give the wrong answer, you know. Um, it's on the test set uh, that contained also out of domain question compared to the validation set that we, you know, we, we had. Uh, on the validation set, we were more around 70% of accuracy. Um, and yeah, we submit a paper, we submit a solution. I give you the link here in the slide if you want to see exactly what, what the data are and so forth. Uh, I think everyone from the leaderboard published a paper, you know, uh, giving their solution. And I reached out to the winner because it was quite impressive, uh, 4%, you know, four points of accuracy higher than me. And um, I asked them, Wait, how did you do that? How did you achieve? Uh, I could congratulate them, of course. But also, how did you achieve such a good accuracy? And he told me he actually used a monomodal solution in the sense that he didn't even encode the question to output the answer. And so it's, it might seem very surprising to, to do so, but then I looked at the, uh, you know, at the question in the data set, and here you have samples of the questions. Um, and I think a question arises, so why, what's the point of this task if, if actually the question is just, hey, what's wrong? Um, so it, it actually just become a monomodal task, uh, you know, an image-based an image task, where you encode the image and just output the diagnostic. Um, I'm not sure exactly like it, the, these kind of questions brings nuances to the to the answer you have to output. Um, obviously, the, the the people that organized the challenge noticed it. Um, it was one of the findings. Um, probably, the data set must be refined uh, and reviewed. Um, and it makes me think of a story uh, that happened also in the natural image field. So you have this famous, I think the first VQA, so visual question answering competition on natural image was in 2015. 
with a first release of a big data set. And some researchers show uh, that just using the question, not even the image, you could answer most that more than 60% of the, of the, of the question. Um, so it was the other way around. The people just used the question and not the image. And the reason was that there was a huge bias in the, the, the question. So for example, if I say, hey, what, what's the color of this banana? You probably don't need the image. It's probably yellow uh, most of the time. Um, also, we, we know that there is also biases in the data set. Like there is you know, mostly white people or, or men. So if the question is, is it a man or a woman in the image? If you say men, you have, even without looking at the image, uh, you know, eight out of 10, you have the correct answer. So visual question answering is a very interesting task, but you have to be very careful about what the data set is. And here exactly these questions, I'm not sure it's really probing the understanding of the machine um, of encoding actually both modalities to make the best prediction. So very interesting, I, I think, findings. Uh, be very careful of the data when you work with multimodal multimodalities. All right, I will move to the uh, second task, which is radiology report summarization and generation. Uh, so what is, is it about? Um, generation, so you have an image and you have to generate a full report or some sections of the report, such as findings or impression, for example. And then you have summarization. Um, it's generating impression from findings. Um, and the question is, where is the multimodality in this radiology report summarization task? Well, you could use the image. You actually have access. Um, you have some data sets where you ha actually have access to the image. So you have the report, you have the findings and the image, and you have to generate the best impression possible um, that is considered as the summary. Um, so there you have a, 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 a multimodal you know, task. And uh, I will talk about radiology report summarization more in depth. Um, state of the art in this multimodal radiology report summarization task, none. Um, I think so far this task has been only monomodal. Um, I think somehow though this task is related to multimodal machine translation where you have, you have a sentence to translate into another language and you have an image describing the source sentence. Right, so here the model uh, would take as input an image, um, a sentence to translate in English, and would output the translation in, in German. The motivation is that sometimes you have to translate from one language to, to another, and with those contexts, some words are ambiguous, and it's very hard to find the right translation. Um, so the question arises, um, so it's a difficult task architecturally-wise. Um, it's very rare to actually have a generation task where you have to output a sequence, but you also have to encode a sequence and an image, it's very difficult. But the second question is, is it worth it, this task of, you know, when you want to summarize a report, do you want the X-ray as well? Um, because isn't all the information already contained into the findings? Do we also have the ambiguity problem in the, you know, uh, in the findings, meaning, is the finding not clear enough so that it's hard to output the summary, the impressions? Um, so I'm going to try to answer this question. And then the second question would be, how do we know that the model is actually using the image? So it's, a, it's good to actually yeah, input the image. But how are we sure that the model just doesn't discard it totally and uh, only use the text? So is it worth it to answer the question? I will, um, I will evaluate um, the impression outputted by the machine with the Rouge F and F1 check six birth metric. Rouge is just an alignment metric, meaning are you the word outputted in the right order given the ground truth impression. Chest six birth is um, a classification model that has been trained on the diagnostics. And the idea is, if I have, if I were to run my generated impression into chest birth, it would give me a diagnostic. If I run the ground truth impression into chest birth, do I have the same diagnostic, right? Um, and if I do, I have one point of accuracy. Okay, so it's a, just a check that a trained classifier find the same diagnostic 
if you input the ground truth impression or the generated impression. And I will try that on both data set, Mimic CXR and Indiana University data set that are quite large scale just X-rays data set. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm uh, at the top right now in the Mimic CXR section. Uh, I have two models on the left, T mono and T multi. T mono, T stands for transformer, okay? So I have a monomodal model and I have a multimodal model. So the findings in Mimic CXR, um, R, sorry, yeah, R2 is rouge, the rouge score, let's say. So yeah, the, the results show that my metric of rouge and check sticks board are a little bit higher when I use uh, multimodality. It's very low though, so we have just 0.6, we have just 0 0.6 improvement over the, you know, the, 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 the rouge score. So he have my word in the right, you know, in the right, um, outputted in the right way. And the chest expert is just around, you know, 0 0.8 point of accuracy as improvements. So it's really, really slim, right? For Indiana, it's not even that. In Indiana, the rule score is higher. Um, though chest expert, you know, accuracy score is higher for the multimodal solution. So it's very not, not clear if the image is helping in this scenario. Uh, we could also have the assembling. So the idea of assembling is just, I, I won't train just one model. I will just try to, tr to train 10 different models uh, with the same settings and then average the prediction just to make sure to, you know, to validate my results. And when I did that, it was even worse. Um, the ensembling results of the monomodal model for Mimic CXR are higher, though chest x F1 score on Mimic is, is still higher for the multimodal solution. Uh, one point of accuracy. And for Indiana, it's actually the same. Um, so using monomodal solution seems to be better if you just have an alignment, you know, an alignment metric, such as bleu, meteor, rouge. Uh, but the impression are probably of more, more correct factually when you use the multimodal solution since the chest x birth score are higher. Now, I still wanted to dig a little bit further um, in the, for example, in the Indiana data sets. Sure, I have a higher chest x birth score, but on which diagnostics? And what I noticed is that for the multimodal solution, I had massive improvement on rarer cases. So for example, lesion, edema, pleural effusion, and cardiomegaly have only four, five, five, and 20 samples. But on these hard cases, the multimodal solution actually most of the time indefined, uh, indefined them. Okay, so we have like up to 500 you know, percent of improvements um, when we use the multimodal solution. The thing is that there is so few cases in this test set that obviously my averaged F1 score will be more or less the same. Um, and this is why, um, you know, I just, you know, the monomodal solution is 79 and the multimodal solution is 80 is because the improvement are in such rare a case that it's not Really, it doesn't show in the average, you know, in the weighted um, F1 score. It's still a nice findings in the sense that the multimodal solutions still manage to output impression that are correct for these rarer cases. Um, so it's one of the findings you, you might not change the world uh, uh, when you input the image, but still uh, from difficult cases, you can, you can manage to improve the, the, the factual correctness of the outputted impression. So it was my, my first try in, uh, in answering the question, is it worth it to input the image when you try to summarize radiology reports? Now, another question I think arises, is um, how do we know the model is using the image? Uh, maybe the, the, the inputting the image is just noise to the model and it just acts as a kind of regularization. And that's why the, the performances are better. So how am I sure that the model is actually looking at the image when outputting the summary? And yeah, sorry, I think the, the solution that I tried to bring forward are applicable for a very you know, wide range of problems. Um, when you have two inputs, 
it's a nice way to check like two modalities, two different inputs. What I'm going to present is a nice way, nice way to check, to ensure, sorry, that your model is using both modalities. Um, but here in the, it will be for hydrology report summarization. The first one is um, I have my finding. Here it is. Um, I have to summarize that into impression. And I will run on my findings an entity, you know, disease recognition module. Um, this network will spot two diseases in my, in my findings, and I just mask them. I call that findings degraded. So it's harder because I'm masking the entity. And so maybe to generate the report, uh, the model will have to look into the image to output the right impression. A second policy would be I'm doing a random masking. Uh, here is a, a second example. Here is my finding. And I just random mask up to a certain percentage um, um, you know, the, 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 the findings. And then that's the impression, the ground truth impression that I have to generate. And I, and I run my model. The monomodal model, I mean, we don't have the time exactly to read it, but it's, 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 it's incorrect. It's not the right model. And indeed, because I masked so much of the findings, um, just, just inputting that into my, my, my monomodal model won't work. The multimodal model though, managed to, to, to still write a, a quite correct impression by spotting the small bilateral pleural effusion and that there is no evidence of pneumonia. Um, so doing that, I, I knew that architectural, architectural, rally, sorry, if my model were to, to find information in the image, it can do it. it it's possible to do it. And, and it's actually looking there. Um, so I think it's a nice way of ensuring that yeah, the model is capable of, you know, fetching information in the in the in the image. Uh, I, I thought I I thought I I, I put the uh, some graphs. So from the paper, I had some um, um, some accurate. I mean, some 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 metrics about these two policies, um, and the results show that the the multimodal will do much better, obviously, than the monomodal. Um, so yes, uh, my model can use the image to to output impression. Now, also, you have a policy of visual sensitivity, and it's very easy. Uh, when you input a finding, you also input the wrong image. And if the model is using um, the image, well, you, you might expect some uh, decreases in your accuracy. It makes sense, right? So every time I input it a findings, I just randomly picked an image on my data set and, and, and give that as input. Um, and indeed, we, we noticed, you know, for the multimodal model that we have a decrease in chest X birth F1 score compared to if I just input the, to the right image of the findings. So it means that, yeah, the, my model has some visual sensitivity that my model is able to, I mean, is able, tries to combine both modalities to generate the best impression. Um, so I think this kind of policy you know, you know, random masking, visual sensitivity are a good way to ensure that your model are using both modalities. Um, very good, for example, for ablation studies. Now, I think there is a there is other way we could use that image. Um, right now, I just input it into my model both you know modalities. But what about mixing hypotheses of a monomodal summarization network and a radiology generation network? So let me explain. Um, instead of doing this, uh, this is you know, what I presented. This is the architecture I was talking about. Uh, we do this. So we have two different models that are two different experts. The first one on the bottom is a classical monomodal summarization model, but I have next to it uh, a radiology generation model uh, that will generate impression from the image. So. The modalities are processed, the two inputs are processed by two different models and, and completely trained separately. And now we have two impressions, two hypotheses. Uh, and the goal would be to somehow enhance um, you know, you know, the impression by using these two hypotheses. Um, 
So it's just splitting the problem in two. So rather, rather you know, having just one model doing everything, it's really hard. Just split the, the, the just split the, the problem in two. Still try. I mean, I, I don't have results. Still have to try that. And I think it would be a very, very interesting direction. We could also do this, um, you know, instead of mixing my summarization model and a, a, a generative model, I just combine uh, my summarization model with a classifier. A classifier that just take the image, output a diagnostic, output the label, and then I have to find a way to make sure that this label is present, you know, in my generated impression. Um, the way we could combine would be to run a third model on top, or it could be end-to-end, -end, uh, or the label, you know, the, the, the representation of the classifier, I just take the representation, right, the, the vector of the image, of its representation, and I even put that into my summarization module. Um, that could help as well. Um, so yeah, I think this is a, I think, interesting future direction. All right, um, it's been 30 minutes. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's time to move on to the unsupervised visual linguistic learning. So I will just talk about contrastive pre-training um, because unsupervised learning is very hard. So I have less to say compared to supervised learning and contrast, con contrastive, you know, it's, 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 um, you know it's, um, it's the method that people are using nowadays um, making a huge hit in many tasks. And the idea of contrastive pre-training, it's a self-supervised technique to learn about the structure of the data without having any labels. Uh, and the way it's done is I'm trying to, com you know, I'm computing representation of my image and my uh, radiology report. And for the aligned sample, you know, for, for, for the correct image and for the correct report, I'm trying to make both representation match and the representation of the other, I'm, I'm trying to make it as far as possible. So you, the, the contrastive pretending aim is to, you know, it's to um, make the diagonal here in blue uh, representation close and in gray. So all the other possibilities, all the other match, uh, you know, as far as possible. And then when you plot the actual learn representation of the image encoder, you find that clusters are forming even though you don't have labels. Um, so you, you actually learn representation of the different diagnostics even though you didn't input any diagnostic at any time. And what's really interesting, I think, is for even for one disease, for one label, which is cardiomegaly, you have two clusters. So it, what it means is that even inside this label, you might have two sub-labels, two diff, you know, even more fine-grained labels. Um, and that's very interesting for a multiple um, reason. It's interesting for few-shot or zero-shot learning. Let's say you have a small data set with so few samples uh, that it's impossible to train a huge neural network. Then you take mimic CXR, you do the contrastive pre-training, and then you fine tune on your own small data set. It's really interesting to tackle the hidden stratification problem. And, and what the hidden stratification problem is, you have a diagnostic and you have two hidden sub-diagnostic of that diagnostic. Um, and it doesn't show in the label. You don't have that annotated. Um, but with this kind of pre-training, you can see that we already have for cardiomegaly, you already have two clusters that might be interesting. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's really good for the hidden stratification problem as well. Uh, you, you are able to spot subgroups among, you know, a super class. It's also very interesting as a pre-training for down, downstream tasks. Um, recall that uh, we had, we just talked about the summarization radiology report uh, task. Uh, I tried to find solution to combine both modalities, you know, training, maybe I should split, you know, that into two expert model, but why don't I just pre-train using both modalities, using contrastive, contrastive pre-training, then I just get rid of the image encoder, and then I just, you know, fine tune 
my pre-training on the summarization task. Because in a way, what's left in my, in my machine is also multimodal representation. Uh, the, 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 um, the representation of my texts has been trained along with the representation of the image. But I just, can, you know, I just cut that once the pre-training is done, and then I fine tune on my monomodal summarization task. Again, something I could try for this task. Uh, and I'm sure it would lead to, lead to very interesting uh, results. And finally, uh, a work that is under review right now, um, it's also very good for systematic error discovery. And what I mean by that is that sometimes the, you will train model and they are prone to systematic error. For example, um, when you train a model uh, to detect collapsed lung in chest X-rays, um, the model will rely on the presence of a chest, chest drain. Um, they will just they will just associate it, you know, collapsed lung with stress drain. But when the patient doesn't have a chest drain, um, but still has a collapsed lung, then the model won't be able to find it. And it's a systematic error that the model will do. Uh, it's a huge prior that it learns, but it's actually false. It doesn't represent what happens in reality. So it's a systematic error. And doing this kind of contrastive pre-training, um, so completely agnost agnostic of the task you are trying to do prevent this kind of systematic error. Uh, it's a work under review that we submitted with a, with a researcher in my lab and, and in another lab, and uh, also an application on, of contrastive pre-training. All right, um, so definitely worth a try uh, when you have different modalities, uh, which I'm talking about linguistic and vision, but it also work with EAG data um, and videos as well. People are trying that on videos as well. So. Um, in the multimodality field, contrastive le learning is a very powerful um, tool. And now about the future tasks. Um, so I'm talk <laughs> I will talk about tasks that don't exist, but could be. Um, and I will stay in the domain of chest X-rays and radiology reports. And um, yeah, uh, I just I just try to <laughs> to discover new tasks. The first one would be unaligned radiology report translation. And what I mean by that is that there is a patches data set. Uh, this is from a hospital in Alicante in Spain uh, that contains 160K image reports pair uh, in Spanish, obviously, annotated with 174 labels. It has been super, it is a really fine grained, uh, really good fine grained annotation. For example, in Mimic, uh, we have 14 classes. So the problem is that in Spanish, we, can't, we cannot use our pre-trained English model. It would be very hard to transfer the knowledge we learn in patches to mimic, for example. So the question is, um, how do we port the reports in the English language domain? So how do, how do we port patches into the language, uh, language domain? Well, we, ha we have to translate it in a way. I think there is three ways of doing that. Um, we could use a trained Spanish English translator on biomedical data. Um, so it's monomodal, right? I just have a Spanish report as input and I output an English report. Um, it, this kind of model exists. Uh, there is the very famous uh, workshop on machine translation that uh, is a summit every year that, uh, you know, submit challenges to the researcher and it's about, you know, translation. And I know there is a biomedical tasks and I know that there is um, the Spanish to English direction. So what I could do is just take this model and, 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 you know, and try. I call that monomodal and out of domain. I say out of domain because it has been trained on data that are not patches and, and, uh, and mimic. We could use unaligned machine translation. So what do I mean by unaligned? Is that we have two data sets with samples. Here is two samples taken randomly. I don't have, for one image, I don't have a direct translation from a radiologist, you know, from, from English to Spanish or Spanish to English. I have no alignment in my data set. So it has to be unaligned. Somehow we have to find a, a middle ground, a way of understanding between both languages and try to find connection between worlds. Um, we can do that. It's called unsupervised machine translation. It's, it's Facebook is the world leader in that domain. 
Um, and how it works is that you, you just train in both languages, Spanish and English. You train to you train to two language model. Okay, one in English, one in Spanish. A language model is just a model that says, I think the next word is the in the sentence is this one, right? It's it's, it's just monomodal, monolinguistic uh, language model. The second step is given these two models, you initialize a translation pipeline. So indeed, you have to encode, for example, English. You can use your English language model. And then you have to decode that in Spanish. And you use your Spanish language model. But with this, and then I'm in the for loop, and I do back translation. With this initial translation pipeline, I do back translation. It means that I have a sentence in English and translate that in Spanish. And from Spanish and translate that back in English. And I compare the two English sentences, and that's my loss for my pipeline. Right? So I do that for all the, you know, all the, the samples, and then and then I update my 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 model, uh, my my translation pipeline, and I and I do that again and again. And this back translation stuff, so going from English to Spanish and then Spanish to English, um, it will refine itself and get better and better. Now, this talk is about multimodality. So um, what about unaligned multimodal machine translation? And now it gets very fancy. So we have an image. Um, so instead of using the text as pivot, and what I mean, what I mean by pivot is where is, the, where is the bridge? What's the common ground? So when I transit from Spanish to English, you know, where, where, where do I go? What's the, what's the bridge? So in unsupervised machine translation, uh, the bridge is, well, my, 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 my language model, okay, is, is, is the text. Now the pivot here could be, could be visual. Um, and what I mean by that, by that is I can train a captioning module or, or, or you know, radiology report generation module. So we talked about this, right? We have an image um, and, and we have a model that describes this image uh, in Spanish. Okay, and what happens is, and sorry, I just have figures with natural images. I don't have figures with X-rays. But on the left, my my I have an image, and and my my arrows in in red are my trained captioning module. And when I have that, I have a, a sentence in, in in English. I have a sentence in Spanish, and I can do back translation. I, I do the same, right? Uh, the I go from the caption to the other language using back translation. Um, on the right, I can do exactly the same, only that I consider the output of the Spanish captioner and the output of the English caption, captioner aligned. I just assume that both translation are the alignment, and I train a model on top of that. So here, the, 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 the pivot you know, to, to go from Spanish to English would be the image, and there is also I didn't, I didn't show that on screen, but there is also ways of putting um, visual representation close to each other in the sense that we could, tr we could try to find a mimic image and a patchest image that are very close together and you know, run the captioning module uh, on top of both of that images and consider that very aligned pair. Anyways, it's very new work. Uh, it's from 2020. It has been done for natural images. I think it would just be fun to do that, you know, on radiology reports because we have these exact same inputs. So, what's the outcome of this research? What what would be the outcome? Well, first we have a, a robust robust translator. Uh, we we have uh, provided that we have a good evaluation set. So, ideally, we have we have ground truth validation or test set. So, because all the training is done in in an aligned way. How do you evaluate it? Well, ideally, you evaluate it on a humanly translated pair. But you know, 500 samples could be enough. Um, so we would have a robust translator. Uh, we could do data augmentation. So imagine with very good quality, I bring all the mimic, uh, sorry, all the patches that I set into the English domain. I just double my number of samples to train deep learning model. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of data augmentation. We could also make much more fine-grained classification on MIMIC. Recall that MIMIC has only 14 labels, while um, Patches has over 170. So it means that we now have reports that we know 
we have that report in English from Patchest that have been labeled with, you know, much more advanced label. And we could infer that, you know, on mimic reports that could be really interesting as well. Also for the hidden certification, you know, problem I just talked about that the hidden certification is um, is identifying in you know, a super class subgroups, sub diagnostics. Um, so yeah, I think there is a lot of application of that research. Okay, how late is it? Um, yeah, okay, this is, I will just few slides, a few more slides. Um, I talked about generative models, right? We, we have, I talked about the radiology report generation. I generate impressions, so yeah, I generate texts. What about generating images? That would be very cool, I think. And it's also a form of that augmentation. So you recall uh, the self-supervised contrastive techniques. Um, I find alignments. This is the famous clip model, right? So, so, so I have two representation from an image and, and a text. And if they match, I try to bring that representation close. Once you have that, you can use it on top of a generative model. And the generative model would be, I take as input a, um, um, a report and I generate an image. And mimic now can be, you know, mimic can be the judge of how good that represent, you know, that generated image is, because what 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 self, you know, what contrastive learning <laughs> is doing is, you know, if I see two representation, are there a good match? And if I do the same with a generative model, then 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 the contrastive learning is saying, okay, what you just generated is a good match with the report you just inputted. We actually try that here in the lab. Um, so we train that what we call a DALI model. DALI is just you, you input a report, it output an, an image, um, you know, just a, recru it's a recon reconstruction, right? Um, and on top, we, 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 had the, we have the opinion of, of CLIP that says, hmm, this generation is not good, try again. And we do that until CLIP is happy. And if CLIP is happy, it means that both representation matches. So it means that probably the image generation generated is good. And the funny story is on the synthetic images generated, we could find most of the, most of the time the right label when we inputted that into a, a classification model, right? So say, for example, your report is plural effusion, you generate an image, this synthetic image, I input that into a classification model and it outputted most of the time the right diagnostic uh, plural effusion in my example. Um, so I think the interesting idea of that is, uh, I think that augmentation, again, you can just generate data. If you could, if you could condition generation on your own you know, set of data, then you would just, you would just you know, generate new data and, and, and augment the size of your data set. That would be one, one application. Um, again, uh, completely thinking out of the box here, um, but I think it would be super cool. All right, um, quarter to two, so it's, it's cool. Um, thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, John Baba, for the amazing talk and going through a lot of uh, ideas and like and also details about multimodal uh, of a vision and language in medical domains. So yeah, uh, let's open up the ground for questions. Does anyone have any questions? If not, um, I have one question. Uh, sure. Yeah, I have two questions actually. So I think the um, the example you gave or the paper you presented uh, about like multimodal versus a monomodal data on uh, like using transparent uh, metric as well as the yeah. route metric. Yeah, that, that the results are actually quite uh, interesting because like uh, the multimodal model actually outperforms much better on the rail classes. So mm -hmm. do you uh, look into like uh, the examples of those uh, rare classes and what do you find there? Yeah, I didn't, so you're right. Um, I, I didn't um, actually went to see the, the, the improvements and which cases it was and analyze it with a radiologist and try to brainstorm on why would the image help in this scenario? Still something we have to do. It's a very good remark because um, 
you're right to validate the result i think you just can't say hey my, my image is helping and, and that's it um i think we maybe we have to identify indeed i think the best way would be to actually look at the report and say indeed the findings is incorrect or the findings is ambiguous and so we can show that yeah using the image in that scenario just helps you to find the right diagnostic um i haven't done that but it's definitely something we should do i agree okay and yeah and also have you um so we presented um like three or two or three methods about how to check if the model is using images right yeah um so so have you actually like looked into like some kind of saliency maps or yeah or tension maps on the images and see if if the saliency makes sense yeah um yeah that's a very good point um so but it's very hard to um, to rely on the science map for, for different reason. Uh, the first one is um, so you, you can't look at all the science maps. You have to cherry pick, right? Mm -hmm. So you can try ways of you will just filter your weights in saying, oh, this this weight here is above zero point five, so it really look there. So you just filter that. Um, so that will be a way to do it, and, and then you try to check. The second, the second thing of that I don't really trust uh, Salency map is that downstream, you you also have um, you know a classifier that will choose or not to pick the visual information. Now, obviously, if it doesn't pick the information, then the gradient doesn't go into the attention map. So the attention map doesn't look at anything. But I mean, it's not because your attention is good that it's still considered you know downstream. Um, it might be completely discarded. Um, so that's why I just like to degrade the input because there I know that there is no way to, uh, it has to rely on the image. And the third reason I didn't look at the sal saliency map is that um, there are more and more paper that are pessimistic about, and, and, and they made that very well in a mathematical way and they show that saliency map is not a health check um, mm -hmm. for various reasons. Like you can find such paper going, you know, being out right now. Um, and I just follow the trend. It has been peer reviewed. It has been accepted. What they say is really interesting. So um, say, I think science map is a really nice way of just, you know, cherry pick for your paper and show that you have a fancy attention module. I don't think it's a way to validate that the visual information is taking into account. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Any other questions here? Yeah, um, I have one. Yeah. Um, so in the there was an example where you mentioned that there was perhaps some hidden stratification. Yes. Um, did you try looking back to see if maybe like let's say I think it was cardiomegaly, like you could further split that class, or was it like a reporting issue that was causing that issue? Or yeah, so um so just just so we are on the same page. Um the, the, the goal of hidden certification, oh, it's not a goal, it's a problem, is that you, let's say you have two subclass of a superclass. Let's say you have 60% accuracy on your superclass. You want 60% accuracy on both your sub, the subclasses, you know, on your two subgroups. Um, and what you show, you know, what, what an example of that is, usually this is not the case. So let's say you have 60% accuracy. On one subgroup, you have 90%. And on the other group, you have way less. Um, that's than 60%. Um, and it just happened, if you use labels, the representation you learn does not allow you to, to, to tackle this problem. While pre-training in an agnostic way, you have these two clusters, you have different clusters forming very naturally agnostic to the labels. So to answer, now to answer your question, no, I didn't go back to see if that two clusters were actually subgroups, subdiagnostics, um, because the image was actually not about this issue, but uh, on all the paper about hidden certification, um, doing this kind of pre-training does help to tackle this hidden certification problem. So this example was for something else. I just wanted to mention that you have even inside, you know, diagnostic clusters forming. Um, but for this particular case, no, I didn't. I didn't go back. But in general, yes, doing that self-supervised pre-training helps having good clustering, you know, before training on labels. Thank you. OK. 
Okay, any other questions? If not, let's give uh, JB a virtual applause. Thank you so much, JB, for the talk. Of and course, thank you. Yeah, we will upload the video uh, of this talk to our YouTube channel later. And uh, anyone, if you have any questions later, uh, feel free to um, uh, enter your questions in the Google Sheet on our website or under the, uh, the YouTube video. Right, thank, thank you. you. See you thank next you so week. much. See you.